them. So I don't think I'm going to have to learn how to use the question and answer function this evening. So thank you for saving me from that as well. Um, we'll get through your questions. I've tried to pick out a number of different ones to cover a wide range of topics around pupillage applications and uh, interviews. And we hope that this will be of some use for you. So just to introduce the rest of the panelists, Oberon, would you like to say a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, um, hello everyone, I'm Oberon. I'm a tenant of six years call at Selborne Chambers and I specialise in insolvency. Um, Selborne are a commercial chancery set in London on, um, on Essex Street. And Leon. Hi everyone, my name is Leon Pickering. I'm a barrister at Tenard Square. I specialise in traditional chancery work. Um, primarily inheritance disputes, so basically humanity at its worst. Um, I, in terms of my background, if people want, uh, I didn't do law at university, I did English, um, I um, specialised in Anglo-Saxon and Old Norse literature, um, and then I did a master's before deciding that academia was a terrible idea, so came across to the bar from there. So that's, that's just a sense of my background as well. Thanks, Leon. And Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi all. So my name's Chris. I'm employed barrister at KPMG. Uh, and I sit within KPMG Law's tax disputes team. Um, as the name suggests, I specialise in tax or heads of tax, so customs, VAT, all of that stuff, uh, and the public law which relates to tax. And obviously, we're very busy with Brexit. Uh, in terms of a bit of my background, I was previously at HMRC Solicitor's Office uh, for three years. And before that, I spent 18 months at the criminal bar as a self-employed barrister, um, sort of acting court wig gown, the whole shebang, uh, and sadly the wig gown haven't been brought out for six years. Before then, like Leon, I studied history and politics, medieval history, so not quite as old as Leon for charity, uh, did a master's and then also did the GDL. Thanks very much. And uh, last but by no means least, Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Laura. Um, I am a barrister at Lamb Building Chambers. I have a mixed practice of family and crime. Um, I was called to the bar in 2014, but took my sweet time getting pupillage um, and didn't start my pupillage until 2018. Um, so I've been a tenant for uh, ooh, a bit longer than that. And I've been a tenant since 2019. Um, and yeah, so I have mixed practice, family crime. I did law at the University of Sheffield, did my BPTC at Northumbria, and then did a variety of jobs whilst waiting for pupillage. Um, I think that's actually something quite useful that people have picked up on already. So I'll just give you a bit of background uh, for me as well. I studied law at Liverpool University because I thought I should do something sensible. I think I prefer the sound of Norse history and all the other ones that have been described. Um, and I went to Manchester Metropolitan University for bar school. I did my pupillage in London as medical law set before coming back to Manchester for uh, third six. And my main specialism is in medical employment law, so defending the NHS. Um, so I hope you've seen already that you've got a wide range of panelists panelists here in terms of academic background. And Oberon, could you just tell us a little bit more about your academic background just to give people an idea yep. of who they're hearing from. Um, I studied a bog standard law degree, I went to Cambridge um, and I applied for pupillage um, during my third year um, mainly because well two reasons firstly because if I took a year out I wouldn't I had no idea what I wanted to do instead um, and the second reason was actually slightly less um, well, uh, the second reason was because I'd just scraped a first class in my second year and I couldn't be sure I would get another first class in my third year. And so I decided what I would do was I would apply during my third year for pupillage, uh, which worked out quite well because I didn't get a first class in my third year, but I got <laughs> um, a pupillage offer, <laughs> which is, I suppose, the more important one. So, um, so that's how I ended up at the bar. Um, I um, ended up specialising in insolvency because... Um, Oh, sorry, I did my BPTC at BPP Law School um, and um, I ended up specialising in insolvency because that was what my pupil master did. Ex excellent tactical judgment required there of a barrister over on. Uh, very canny of you. So as I say, I hope you can see that the Inn have picked a, a number of us from different backgrounds with different specialisms and we're all relatively junior. I think 
somehow I've ended up being the most senior probably now at 12 years call this summer. Don't know quite, how, all right, Leon, lower those eyebrows. I don't quite know how that's happened. Um, but I do sit on the interview panels and I think most of us are all involved in recruitment. And even for me, it really doesn't seem like that long ago I went through the process and I can't believe I've become one of those people who says things like that. So let's move on to the questions from that point. So first question. And I think this was the most popular question in one, phrase, uh, one form or another. How do we approach the question of why do you want to be a barrister without sounding cheesy? Laura, what do you think? It's really hard to, to say that without being cheesy. It, is, it was my overall feeling when trying to answer that question. Um, I don't want to sound like a cliche. Um, and this is probably the most cliched thing I'm going to say tonight, but you just have to be honest and give, um, give the reason. If you've got to this point where you're looking at a pupillage application, there's obviously been something that's made you get to that point. You don't stumble across um, pupillage. So there's obviously something that has led you to that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, watching Silk then made you want to be a barrister. That may well be the truth of it, but there must be something else that's made you feel that the career at the bar is right for you. Um, so as long as you give a really honest answer, you can't necessarily, in my view, be criticised for whatever your answer may be, particularly if once you've done some work experience, and I know there's a lot of questions about work experience, but once you've done some work experience and you've seen what life at the bar is like, and it isn't glamorous necessarily then you can you can definitely answer that question honestly and not be criticized so even if you started with an idealistic view um, you might have something else that has led you now to this filling in a pupillage application okay I'm going to come on to ask a few more of, the, of you that question but um, you'll have seen on the questions already and I'll flag this up now, that a number of people are asking, well, how do we get that practical experience that Laura is talking about? Or how do we answer these types of questions? When we were planning to do mini pupillages in 2020, that was our year, we were going to get them out the way, and COVID hit. So we haven't had them, or we've had very brief online mini pupillages. Um, Leon, thinking to the first question, how do you answer it without being cheesy? But factoring that in that these days it's not quite as easy for people to get experience as it as it used to be and it wasn't that easy then either yeah short answer on the first one is um my set doesn't have that question because we think it's a terrible question and we don't think it really gets a huge amount of useful information out of people um but having having talked through put pe people through applications where they do have to answer that question um my my i think one of the best things to do is 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 try and sort of dig deep down in terms of actually what is your life going to be like talk about what your life is going to be like in terms of the lifestyle um yeah everyone knows at a sort of surface level what barristers do but if you can show a little bit of deeper knowledge of what things might how things might work um then that can be quite a good thing in terms of getting experience look it's incredibly difficult at the moment um obviously it is i, I you know quite a few sets are doing their best to run sort of virtual mini pupillages. Um, I know my set is, I'm, I'm on parental leave at the moment, but um, you know we're trying to set that up and do that. Other places are, but they are going to be few and far between. So opportunities are going to be thin on the ground. However, there are things you can do. Um, there are a number of projects going on at the moment around transparency that will um, encourage you to get involved in logging in and actually watching um, remote hearings. So you could do that. Um, the one I'm most aware of um, is runs around the Court of Protection Transparency Project. Uh, that, if you are interested in that sort of work, either from a medical welfare side of things or a, a property side of things, you could have a look at getting involved in that. It will also teach you about injunctions um, because you will be under very, very strict media reporting restrictions. You have to think very carefully about how you put them in your application. So there are opportunities, but yeah, it is it is difficult at the moment. Um, but everyone looking at applications in the next God knows four or five years is going to be well aware of this. Okay, I mean, I, I'm sort of I'm mentally marking you know seven eight years down the line when we start when we're looking at A levels for the last couple of years. 
Yeah, we are going to have that in mind. We're not going to expect people to have a bag full of mini pea villages and marshalling and things like that. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, that's a really good point, Leon. And I think the point you made about watching hearings online is a very good one. Um, almost all of the employment tribunal work has gone online now, and it's been very rare that we've had an observer on there. But you're perfectly entitled to be. You just need to contact the tribunal and find out some login details. Now, coming back to the initial question about the why do you want to be a barrister question, Oberon, you're in a very specialist practice area in a very specialist set. Do you think that has a different sway or emphasis on how someone should be answering the question about why they want to be a barrister if they're applying to do your sort of work? Uh, there is a difference because um, what we often see in candidates who apply for commercial transferring sets is that they have a slightly different reason for coming to the bar than, for example, people who apply for publicly funded work um, at the bar. Um, the way I would suggest you think about it is, uh, I, I echo the sentiment of being the best version of yourself, but also look at what other options you have which you would, you would be able to otherwise consider. So you've got a good degree, you're driven, you're smart, you're hardworking. You know, it wouldn't just be money at the bar because if you only cared about money, you would go out and do other things which are more lucrative. You could go be a commodities trader at JP Morgan or an accountant at Deloitte, both of which will pay far more than, than a, even a barrister, a, pu a pupil barrister at the commercial chancery bar. So um, that's, I think, how you should think about it. You don't need to come across as some sort of um, a campaign on on on, on the um, on the path to saving the world. Um, someone in my chamber said, um, you know, it's all very well to be Superman, but who wants Superman as your pupil? Um, <laughs> in terms of work experience, um, uh, many pupilages. It's true that many pupilages have um, suffered a setback during the pandemic, but sets are starting to do remote many pupilages. Uh, which means that you are doing obviously um, your um, looking at papers in your home with the chance to contact your mini pupil supervisor over Zoom or whatever, um, and um, you know with with regular contact uh, over Zoom. And what we've been doing is that we've been inviting our mini pupils to come back uh, to court physically when they do resume, so that they don't miss out. Um, if, if they end up doing a remote mini uh, during this period. Uh, in terms of watching hearings, um, court lists, for example, the Rolls Burning Court list will have emails of ushers there in, inviting people to send an email in if you want a hearing link. Um, send an email and you'll get a hearing link and, and um, just watch the hearings from, from, from your home. It's not, as, uh, it's not problematic. Um, Chris, you, you're coming at this from a couple of different perspectives. As you say, you were at the criminal bar to start with, and then you went to KPMG. Um, do you think this question, uh, and I accept it might not be exactly asked like this, but it, it has to be answered differently depending if you're wanting to go um, in-house rather than just to the self-employed bar? Potentially. So one of, the, one of the oddities about the employed bar is that some of your employers might not really care whether you're a barrister or whether you're a solicitor. Um, and GLD is a really good example. GLD, I'm sorry, and that's government legal department, tends not to draw a distinction between whether you're going to be a solicitor or a barrister, and they offer people as they offer training contracts. So you'll, you'll get a very different question. It'll be, why do you want to be a government lawyer? And obviously that has two parts. Why do you want to be working for the government? And why do you want to be a, be a lawyer? So you may well have a very different question. Some, for some employers, though, will be specifically looking for people who want to be barristers and so it's much more akin to this sort of question um, and obviously you need to make sure what it, what type of pupillage is being offered is it sort of a traditional barrister pupillage or is it more like a rolled up pupillage training contract like in the case of GLB and are KPMG and, and firms like that finding online alternatives for work experience at the moment or is it just not happening it does vary, um, it's sometimes not. Uh, so KPMG isn't really offering um, online mini pupillages slash work experience and law just because it's very difficult to organize. But what we are, what I would echo as everybody else has said is there is still a lot of ways to get experience out there. Um, Laura, you mentioned that the employment tribunal is now online. For anybody who's interested in tax, and it, it, it honestly is exciting and good fun, 
for the first time ever, the FTT's listings are uh, for the tax chamber are online. And as everyone has said, there's an email address which you are welcome to email to ask how I please watch these proceedings. Um, so they are different, but the opportunities are still there. Great. And for those who aren't sure, FTT is First Tier Tribunal. Um, Laura, you're a criminal and family practitioner. Um, what's the situation there with getting work experience? Are people still going to court with you? Um, we haven't had any mini pupils in chambers for uh, probably for most of the pandemic. And even now, um, as you can appreciate, family uh, hearings are nearly all private so you can't follow those online um, without very specific permission and it's generally being given um, to uh, certain legal bloggers so you can keep up to date with certain things through things like um, Lucy Reed, who uh, is part of the transparency project um, you can follow her but as regards to kind of coming to court at the moment I wouldn't necessarily advise it. In normal times, I would say go along and sit in a Crown Court or sit in a Magistrates Court. But at the moment, I wouldn't advocate that anyone does that. Um, it's not a legal obligation, so you wouldn't be allowed to anyway. Um, but when you can, if you feel like you've struggled to get work experience, particularly in areas like crime and family, where we don't necessarily have papers that we can send out to people as you would in a more paper-based practice, once the travel restrictions are lifted and you are able to go and sit in court, by all means, go and, go and do that. Um, you won't necessarily get the same experience as you would on a mini pupillage, but you will still get a feel of what goes on, particularly in a criminal courtroom. Um, as members of the public, you're not thrown out during legal argument as the jury is, so you will get to hear all of those arguments. And it's amazing how much you can pick up from things like that. So at the moment for crime and family, there's nothing that's really obvious that you can do because of the situation we're in. Some sets are starting to work out how many pupillages can work again. Um, I know my set is, we're gonna try and work out how we can fit something around um, the current restrictions, but it is very difficult with papers. Um, it's much more of a people rather than paper-based practice. So it's much more difficult, but there is nothing to stop you logging on to um, webinars and seminars, lots of chambers are running that kind of thing. And whilst you may sit there and think it's a bit passive, you will be surprised what you pick up. And lots of sets are doing things like that. So whilst it's not direct experience, it's something that you can pick up on and talk about in other areas of your application. There may be a topic that you can um, draw on for some of your other pupillage application questions. And my chambers, King's Chambers, did a virtual open day, I think on the days where we'd intended to have our mini pupillage fair, which is a two day event. Um, and I, I imagine that will have allowed more people to attend than would have happened if it was online. Now, of course, we don't know how long these restrictions are going to last for and in what form. So I think it's something that you need to be alive to now that you may not be able to cure that lack of mini pupillages in the usual uh, format. Uh, potentially this summer when you might hope to be finishing your studies and so I'd be keeping your eyes peeled for what's out there and I think Laura makes a very good point we always advocate going to court sitting in and watching hearings and to be frank it's not something that students do all that often other than re when required by the BPTC providers but you can do that for an afternoon a morning a couple of days here a couple of days there and so when you say to us I haven't got time I can't fit it in that may well be the case with mini pupillages these days but when it comes to sitting at home and watching a court hearing or going to court and watching it's always dangerous to tell a barrister you don't have time to do something and it's actually really being made easier for you now um, to be able to do that from home so don't be afraid to take that approach we will value it and when it comes back to Leon's point about answering the question of why you want to be a barrister and actually looking at what the job is or Laura saying don't be too idealistic you need to get an idea of it eventually this is a way to do that what do you see on that screen that you want to be doing yourself tell us about that okay now sticking somewhat with the covid complications of pupillage as if it needed to be made any more difficult uh, the next question we have is how do i best research and learn more about chambers during this time where mini pupillages have been extremely hard to come by. 
Now, we've heard about online events and uh, Chambers looking into making alternatives for many pupilages, so we'll not focus on that. Um, but Christopher, KPMG, what could people do to try and understand more about what it is that KPMG does? Google, LinkedIn, um, all, you know, all of the classic answers, and uh, that might sound flippant, but it genuinely isn't. So KPMG, like all of the law firms, um, have large profiles uh, on their websites and on LinkedIn, where they are producing a lot of material about who they are and what they do. Uh, and reading that sort of material is the best way to research about the firm and then following through the links. So the vast majority of firms will have sort of an opening news page of, you know, here's what we've been doing. And they'll be linked through to various resources which they produce for clients or as sort of a bulletin of these are things which you need to be aware of. And again, that'll give you an insight into what you're doing, uh, what the firm's doing, and whether that might be something you'd be interested in, but also the way in which they are doing them. So if you compare and contrast the different alerts, for example, then, then that will give you a, a good example. M most of the material which is produced, particularly on LinkedIn, for example, is deliberately open to the public domain. So it's very easy to, to find it, look at it, and if you're interested, you tag on that like, you're interested in that particular LinkedIn profile, and then it'll give you updates. I'm sure there's a technical term, which I'm afraid I'm, I'm not savvy enough to know. That's the best way of learning, particularly at the moment, um, about the firms which you might be interested in. GLD is obviously slightly different, uh, and in fact, GLD colleagues um, probably need to flag that. Um, but again, GLD and the wider GLS have a lot of material out there on the internet and on LinkedIn, and it's worth looking at it. Um, we know, people on this panel know people who are at GLD, and they're doing sort of interactive panels so it is well worth, if you're interested in that sort of thing, look, trying to find those panels and either finding a recording or finding a future panel which you can watch just like this one. How about you, Oberon? Do you think uh, there are any different approaches that students can take for looking at Chambers and trying to learn a bit more about them? Um, go on the Chambers website and look at the recent cases that members have been involved in because and every set will publish news of interesting cases that their, their, their barristers have been involved in. Um, what you can do is to look at journals, uh, legal journals, which are geared towards practitioners in the area of law that, that, your, that your set uh, practices in. Um, so for example, I, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, the Cambridge Law Journal, Law Quarterly Review. Um, so for example, if you're if your passion is property, for example, if you want to read the legal section of the Estates Gazette, um, if your passion is insolvency, you want to read the legal section of the, um, uh, the, the you want to read insolvency intelligence. Um, those publications will be on Westlaw or Lexis, so you don't need to go into a library and find it. Um, flick through the last four or five issues. Um, the practitioners who are writing in those um, publications will be addressing the same issues and will be talking about the same interesting things that the set that you're applying for will also be interested in. And if you can find and, uh, and get attuned to those issues, then you'll impress your interviewer. I think that's really good advice. And uh, I think most of the rest of us would say similar sorts of things. Have a look on the website, have a look on Twitter, follow the chambers on Twitter, read up on what people are doing. There's so much more information available online about what practitioners are doing than ever has been before. And I think probably more so because of the pandemic, because we're doing our work online anyway. I mean, I'll be frank, I'm terrible for it, but a lot of my colleagues do a lot better. So there should be some people there that you can pick up information about. Um, I noticed we had a question, a follow up from a previous point where we asked, um, it said, thank you for your answer. I understand that there are opportunities available. However, we have to send in our applications now. And so far, it has been very difficult to gain direct and relevant experience. How can we make up for this in our applications now? Well, I think I would say that you could ring or email a course or tribunal tomorrow and ask for the list for next week. I'm not saying it's easy to get through to every tribunal. Um, I think probably if you went on court serve, you'd be able to set up your own profile, but I'm not sure that would necessarily give you the information you need. Um, but start ringing around or emailing, because even if you watch an hour of a preliminary hearing, you will gain 
buzzwords and an understanding of what happens compared to if you don't. If you watch an hour of a tax tribunal and you go to um, a tax set or, or a general commercial chancery set and say, this is what I saw in a tax tribunal that I thought was interesting, the interviewers will immediately think, gosh, this person's actually genuinely interested in what we do. Because I think, again, the panel would agree with me that it's always surprising how either generic applications are um, or wrong in that they are talking about the wrong areas of law when they are applying to us. And so when you can show us that you genuinely are interested in the practice area that you're applying for, and that really is demonstrated just by watching a hearing and telling us about it, and what you found interesting and why you'd like to do it, you get major brownie points for that. Certainly, that's the way I've always perceived it, because it's not something that people do all of that often. OK, moving on. To, oh, sorry, Leon, go for it. Just wanted to dive in on that very quickly. Um, look, you won't necessarily have a huge amount of direct and relevant experience. Um, that, you know, yes, do your best to build that up. But also think about this, OK? Transferable skills. Use experiences you, you have uh, and talk about them and, and show how they you know, would be useful and would bring across deployment to your practice as a barrister. The absolutely, without a question, best application I have ever heard of. Um, it was to um, my wife's old set, but I'll tell you this, um, bit of experience with somebody who was working as a bin man in Gloucestershire during the floods about 10 years ago got involved in the flood relief effort, captains a rescue boat. Okay, so leadership, independence, motivation, bang, 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 bang. Okay, no clear, you know, it's not, it's not legal experience or anything, but it looked absolutely amazing because it's everything you're looking for in a barrister. So think about how you deploy your other experiences as well. Yeah, for me, for my background, because I came to law very, very late, I didn't I, I, I had no debating, no, no real mooting experience at all. I got a couple of mini privileges under my belt, but most of the time I had to think, well, actually, how am I going to talk about the teaching I did? How am I going to talk about running security for university events and things like that in a way that will come across as useful? So do, you know, do include your not obviously relevant experiences as well. That's an excellent point, Leon. Um, We've got some more questions about uh, how do I talk about my experiences? What if I don't have this experience? Ultimately, it's about telling us what have you done? What can you demonstrate to us from your previous experience that shows you will be a good barrister in this set and in this area of law? And that's why I say watch a hearing if you can or read up on areas of law that you're interested in so you can pick up right what does it take to be an employment barrister what's it take to be a criminal barrister what's it take to be a tax barrister what sort of work do they do go back to Oberon's point of having a look on the website what are they doing what skills are required to be good at that type of law and what have I done that demonstrates I can be good at that because that's what we want to know not just you know will we get on with you and the likes of that but really it's will you be good at this job and don't be shy about it you need to tell us clearly why you think you will be good at this job don't make us put two and two together to try and get to four tell us what four is um on that point we've got a question um from i assume a part-time student asking whether when uh, they're applying will chambers take account of the fact that they don't have as much time for mooting or debating or pro bono opportunities um, Laura, uh, do you have a view on this? Absolutely. Um, I think it's really easy to get bogged down in how much mooting, how much debating you've been able to do. Um, and this might be a bit of a controversial view, but I don't think all mooting and debating are the be all and end all of every application. Unless you have done phenomenally well and you have gone and represented the UK in mooting or debating at some fantastic, in you know, institution then you should have done it to get some you know to get gain some understanding but as Leon was just saying it's more about everything else that you you've had to do I did um I don't think I ever did debating properly um I messed around a bit on my year abroad but I did some mooting in my final year at university and then that was it I never touched mooting again um 
and it didn't harm me because I had other things going on. Like I say, you need to have done it to tick the box um, and say that you've done it and you've appreciated it. But I, can't, I couldn't agree more with what Leon said about your other experiences matter so much. And if as a part-time student you are working, you are likely to have had skills from other areas that you can bring in. The skills you learn in mooting and debating are about putting together a case and arguing your point. If anybody works in retail and you've ever had to argue a point with a customer about returning something, you've still argued that point. You've still made that, made that point. And it may seem that you know, you're having to put yourself up against these people who've done you know, all this mooting and debating. But if all they can put on their form is, I have mooted, I have debated and have nothing else behind it, then their application is no stronger than somebody else who hasn't done that. So if you're a part-time student, pick up what you can but don't fret and don't spend every waking minute fretting that you haven't, you've only done three moot competitions when everyone else around you has done four or five. It's just not necessary. I really hated meeting. I didn't like it, it at all. Um, and to be honest, a part-time student that's managing to juggle work, home life, studies, is probably demonstrating to me, or you can tell me about, far more useful time management skills that I would really like to have in a pupil um, than potentially wanting to argue about some archaic point of law um, that isn't generally how practice works. Um, Christopher, I saw you nodding along to what Laura was saying. Would you like to add anything? I was just going to say... Um... I, so I, I, I mark the applications for meeting secretaries um, and in some ways it's obviously very different from people's application, but in some ways it's exactly the same. It's showing that you are good for this particular job. And I just wanted to read what everyone said, which is it's, it's experiences which matter. And the best application which I ever saw was from a part-time student who didn't have much meeting experience, which you would have thought would be quite important for a meeting secretary. But much like Leon was saying it, with his example, this particular application said, I'm a part-time student. This is why I'm a part-time student. This is what I do in the other time, in the other time. And this is why what I do, and it was a personal thing, will help me to do this job and be a good barrister. And it was bang, bang, bang. It was very much making the case. This is my point. This is my evidence. This is why I'm awesome. Point two, this is my case. This is the evidence. This is why I'm awesome. And it was just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and so what Leon was saying, I think, is absolutely true. Uh, and I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, Oberon, you're in a commercial chancery set. So um, people coming at it potentially with a slightly different approach than, say, to um, a criminal chambers. Um, what's your view generally on the need for meeting or debating or pro bono opportunities? And what sort of things in that area would you think your chambers is looking for? Um, I'd say that they're helpful, but certainly not a prerequisite. Um, I quite enjoyed muting. I was actually master of muting at, at, when I was at Cambridge. Um, but it was it, it. It's not the only way to tick a box muting uh, or debating. Um, it's uh, it, it's not about what you did. It's about how you acquired the skills that make you shine on on the application. And that might be um, because you've, you've worked a, a second job. And then that might be because you've done volunteering work outside of the law and might have nothing to do with the law. Um, the, the, the thing is, someone can be taught the law um, in a particular specialist area during pupillage, like insolvency. That's not a problem. But you can't teach motivation or dedication to your work um, and qualities like that are qualities which are not necessarily demonstrated through muting. And you can do other things, such as through uh, work outside the law, which demonstrates those qualities. Great advice there. OK, sticking with the application process um, before we come on to where we'll come on to some interview questions uh, shortly. So looking at how we actually fill in the applications, and I think we're looking at pupillage gateway ones in particular or similar forms that don't tend to see many that are CV and covering letter anymore. Um, are the experiences you put in the legal employment boxes meant to be different to those you put in reply to the chamber's specific questions? Um, my only observation on this is that 
if you have a lot of things that you want to tell the, I was about to say tribunal, too used to being in a hearing, that you want to tell the chambers about, then do spread it out in terms of describing your experience. It's not a sort of, oh, they put that in the wrong box, why isn't it there? We do appreciate there are word limits. Um, if, though, you don't have uh, lots of things you want to tell us about, but you want to be more specific, um, then it's fine to repeat it, but don't just repeat the answer. You do still need to tailor it to the question that you're being asked. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything on that point. No, okay. A um, couple more on applications then. Um, this one um, slightly um, uh, tickled me, uh, which sounds very uh, sad, I'm afraid. When asked to write about a case in an application, should you play it safe and pick a UK Supreme Court one, or should you pick out a very niche one? Um, I can't tell you the last time I had to refer to a Supreme Court case. To me, that is very niche. That isn't the day-to-day -day law I deal with. Um, I do have European law because that feeds into discrimination law, um, but it tends to be employment appeal tribunal or court of appeal. And so from my perspective as predominantly an employment practitioner, I would say pick something that is useful in the field of employment or relevant in the field of employment. And I mean something from the Employment Lawyers Association brief, the IDS, have a look at the updates on Westlaw or Lawtel, not necessarily something that has caught the headlines um, in the newspapers, because that might not actually be something that's relevant to me. Um, Leon, you're in a very specialist area as well. Um, what would you say about picking a UK Supreme Court case to play it safe? I, I, I think personally, I, I'd, I'd avoid Supreme Court um, because everyone will know about it already. Um, I think showing it's a good opportunity to show, as Laura was saying, show your knowledge of a, of a practice area. Pick something that people will know about, but is just not completely obvious. Um, so pick a point. It doesn't have to be completely and utterly niche. Um, you know, I've got, I've bore you now. You know, don't tell me about the one case in the last 150 years on conditional revocation of law of, of wills, okay? Because everyone is just going to be. But um, something that is going to be moderately useful on that. Do personally, and this is only a personal opinion, avoid picking a case that people at that set were in. Okay, uh, personally, I, I think that's a good general plan to have because you are guaranteed then to be talking to people who will know a hell of a lot more about it and will have very strong views about it. Um, and they will either trip you up or, or shoot you down. Um, so I, I would go for something in the practice area, but not too close to anyone's heart. Great uh, point, Leon, to pick something useful. We're doing a useful job here. We're not academics. The, the job is academic, but we're not arguing points of law for the sake of it. Um, Laura. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that from a kind of um, family law is my really is my best example of this. Um, there's quite a lot of really kind of hot family law topics that you might think you want to pick up on for that kind of question. So something like no fault divorce um, or the kind of Charlie Gard, Alfie Evans type cases um, are things that you can pick up on. But as Leon said, and as Laura said, they're quite obvious. So, you know, for family, some of the things that you can look at, if you go on the Bailey website and look at the um, Court of Appeal cases they have generally on them in family uh, particularly they almost have a little description next to them in the in the title about what they've been about and it may be something like relocation or um giving a child medical treatment which might be slightly charlie guard-esque but it's a bit different or you know contact arrangements for children um or local authorities removing children or teenagers from the care of their parents things like that are as laura said useful is the best word they're cases that are far more run of the mill whereas you know if we read all about you know Alfie Evans again or you know the no fault divorce case everyone's got a view on that you're not likely to bring anything interesting if I was marking an application and they specifically said well this is the case I'm interested in you can then follow it down the rabbit hole from the court of appeal as well and see where the case started and trace it back up and that can help you form more of a view rather than something that's been in the supreme court that has you know every academic has written everything that can be said on it find something new to talk about it doesn't have to be 
niche. It can just be something that's not obvious. Yeah. Okay. Um, question for uh, Oberon and then Leon. Um, would you advise applicants to wait until they've completed the bar course to apply for pupillage? Oberon. Um, no, there's no harm in, there's no harm in starting as soon as you can and, 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 and applying in your third year of university or during your GDL year. There's no harm in that. Um, you know, the, 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 the process is so competitive that I don't see much benefit in waiting for a further year. I think that's just and the short answer. Yeah, Leon, um, you said that you came to the bar after some other roles. Uh, what's your view? Um, I, I, would, I would positively urge people to apply as early as possible. Um, so before, bef before you've completed the, the bar course, before you start the bar course, if at all possible, though obviously a bit late for that advice now. Um, the three reasons, okay? One, the more times you apply, the more chances you have getting pupillage. Yeah, that's, that's a nice obvious reason. Okay, reason number two, you get better the more applications you do. Okay, and if you're getting interviews, you get better the more interviews you do. I still have flashbacks to my first two or three interviews, okay? They were absolutely appalling. Okay, third point, no one cares if you reapply. Okay, no, 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 I, I do not sit there and go, ooh, I remember this person from last year. Okay, I, 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 I don't have the brain capacity for that, quite frankly. Um, very, very rarely you will see a set who will say something like, if you, if we interviewed you and you didn't get any further, then we encourage you not to apply again the next year. My set does not do that. And my set currently has a, at least one junior tenant who we interviewed in a number of different rounds um, before he was given pupillage. We are, we are very pro it. So it is possible that there might be a little bit of discouragement, but really no. So you are not, you're not losing all of your opportunities if you apply early. So please, please do apply early. Um, I, I, I strip. Sorry, Liam. No, I was going to say there's nothing better than than being able to start the bar course, um, or being able to to not have to worry about a sort of a gap year after the bar course, um, with with pupillage in place. So why not take the opportunity? Yeah, I, I can't really fathom why you wouldn't. Um, I would actually say sometimes we do remember applicants. Usually if you've been to interview, and I've always really known it as being, a, oh, they nearly got there last time. Let's see how they get on this time. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a positive if you've got to that stage, um, or it might just be you've got a particularly unusual um, uh, uh, hobby, but that's, you know, not, not the standout thing necessarily that makes us interested or, or, or not interested. It just flags it up to us. So, um, uh, although when I applied to King's Chambers for third six, they did get my pupillage applications. Um, I never even got an interview there for pupillage and they pulled up my old um, pupillage applications. And I was asked a question about it in my interview where I was asked um, in a pupillage application, I'd said that I was hoping to do work with the free representation unit. And I'd started doing it in my pupillage year when I'd been in London. So I was asked, why did it take me so long? And I answered the question as it being harder to get a place on a free training course than it was to get Rihanna tickets, which again, really dates me. Um, and somehow I still got a third six despite referencing Rihanna. I clearly had the right audience. But I remember when I was writing my pupillage application form and thinking, I know I'm going to do free work, but I haven't managed to get a place on the uh, course yet. There's a course coming up that I'm going to bid for a place on. It's just how it used to happen. Um, with the training I don't think it has like this for years um, I wonder if I should say I'm doing it already because I will be by the time I get an interview if I get one and I thought no best to play it safe as to what is actually true at the moment and I'll give them further details if I get there and if I had said that and I then didn't get the place on the course in London or wasn't able to attend and there'd been that delay it might have looked like I'd been dishonest on the earlier application form so that's the only thing I would caution it's absolutely no reason not to apply but make sure what you're saying is honest and accurate and if you are applying again go back and look at what you said last time to make sure you don't contradict yourself or don't accidentally and unintentionally contradict yourself 
Um, but the sooner you apply, the sooner you've got a chance of getting key pledge. Um, okay, couple more questions just before we get to the seven o'clock mark on applications. Um, we've had a similar question to this in the chat function, um, but the question that had been put on Slido was, is it dangerous to acknowledge that your interests remain very broad? Should you feign interest in a niche specialism? Uh, Christopher, what do you think? Um, I think that's really hard. Uh, that's a really hard question. That's a really good question. So I should have probably said this before. Full disclosure, KPMG doesn't do key pledges and I, I don't, I'm not involved in recruitment to KPMG. Um, but from a sort of, from, from my personal experience and also from a sort of general employer tax perspective, uh, some areas of law might sound quite niche, but are actually extremely broad. Tax is a really good example. In order to do tax properly, you need a good understanding of tax, of public law, of EU law. Every so often you have trust problem and a contract problem. And a lot of areas of law are like that. Um, and, you know, and I think I think in the right circumstances, it's really good to acknowledge that and to say, actually, perhaps I'm really interested in this area of law because of the breadth of work which it involves. Other areas of law which you might be interested in won't be as broad. And it's perfectly fine to say um, that that's, that's what I want to do. I think really it comes down to, do you know what you want to do? Do you want to do something which is broad like tax? Or do you want to do something which is much more specialist and you get very specialist lawyers within tax and you get very specialist lawyers outside of tax? So have a think about what you really want to do and, and why. Personally, my practice is quite broad. I, I practice across all of the heads of tax. There are definitely roles for, for lawyers. And if you want that it like that, if you want that sort of practice, go for it and be honest about it. Um, Oberon, what would you say? Well, speaking as someone who practices in a very niche area, I'm always a little suspicious when a 22-year-old comes up, 21-year-old comes up to me and says they really want to practice corporate insolvency because, you know, no, you're either very strange as a, a you're either a very strange kid or you're just <laughs> not, you're just, or you're feigning the interest. Um, the, um, Sets don't expect their junior juniors or their pupil barristers to specialize in a particular area. And it's completely acceptable. And indeed it's completely um, expected that their junior junior barristers will be very broad specialists. There's nothing wrong with that. And in, uh, Chambers encourage it because it exposes you to different areas of the law and gives you different skills. So I would say no, don't feign, a, don't feign interest in a niche area unless you've really got an interest in that area. I feigned an interest in the first year because I just wanted to stay up north and it worked out terribly for me because I'm not a good, good enough advocate to convince someone I wanted to do family law. Um, in my chambers, we actually do recruit to practice areas. So that would be um, public law. Um, which can often be a mix of both planning and course of protection, which are vastly different, but fall under a public law heading. Um, it can be uh, personal in injury, clinical negligence. It can be business and property, which is what we now call chancery commercial. Um, but people aren't always offered pupillages in the teams that they apply for, because it might be that we see something in you or in your experience that makes us think, no, we think you're going to be better suited elsewhere. And I think this comes back to the point we were making earlier about tell us about what about the job are you interested in because as Oberon says why would you know you're interested in corporate insolvency I've come to insolvency in later years for me to better understand cheapy cases in employment where a company goes bust and potentially their business and staff are picked up by someone new thought I'd better learn something about it but I bet I'm going to hate this I really didn't. I think it's really, really interesting. And I had absolutely no idea that I was going to find it interesting. Equally, the clinical negligence side of my medical law pupillage, I couldn't fathom I could be quite so bad at something because I just didn't enjoy it. Um, so you don't know. And I think that's where it's best to focus on what are your skills? What sort of work I do you want it to be um, submissions advocacy? Do you want it to be trial advocacy? Do you want to do paperwork advisory work are you interested in? Um, and then if you do have an interest that perhaps explains why and if you're not sure 
you can discuss other practice areas and ultimately it can just lead to you being more honest with the chambers and maybe allowing them to see well do you know what maybe they're not quite right for the public law one we think they'd be a better trial advocate perhaps they should spend more time in employment um, Laura, you do two areas that often go together, but are actually quite different. Um, do you think you and, and chambers like yours that perhaps cover a broader spectrum, maybe take a different view of whether you should say you're interested in a particular area or not? Yeah, it's definitely different chambers to chambers. And as you were saying with your chambers, Laura, quite a lot do recruit into certain practice areas. My chambers doesn't. Um, we are historically a criminal set, so you are expected to do crime. Um, but we have a really um, good immigration uh, team and we have a pupils who've just finished their pupillage and got tenancy, they were very interested in immigration. Um, when I joined, I was known as the family pupil because I did want to do family as well. And so Chambers allowed me to do both, um, even though, as I say, we are expected to do a bit of crime as well. Um, in answer to the, will you be found, well, um, should you feign an interest, there's always a risk you'll be found out. And I would bear that in mind about specific niche areas, particularly if you're going to a very niche set um but you tend to find particularly as laura said with crime and family they do often go together and they do have some similarities but they are and can be incredibly different and you can make yourself a better family barrister by doing crime and i think you can make yourself a better criminal barrister by doing family because you have to do a bit more social work with family than you probably do in in any other kind of area apart from maybe court protection um, so you do have those skills so again it comes back to that issue about transferable skills and what you what where you can and can't fit in certainly if you're coming to chambers who do a broad spectrum there's nothing wrong with saying look you, I see you do every area but I'm really interested in crime but I'm interested in looking at the other things as well you may find that you come up against some issues but probably more so it would be a question in interview um, if you said I want to come to so if it was my set I want to come to lamb but I only want to do family I don't want to touch anything else it would more be a question in interview rather than preventing you from getting to interview but it's something worth bearing in mind that lots of areas can in fact make you a better practitioner further down the line I think that's right um, I, I, uh, I think if you didn't have an idea at all it might suggest that you didn't know why you were applying to that chambers or why you wanted to be a barrister. And that's where it can come back to the skill sets and the overlap you've described. The question in the Q&A function was about wanting to do employment law and should I talk about other areas? Well, there's no reason not to be open to other areas. Um, but if you're being asked about that, talk about what bits of the work you like. Is it the trial work? Is it the uh, fact that there's some uh, European law in there. I'm not sure you should say that anymore, but, um, you know, points like that. Chris, Christopher, what do you think? I, I was just going to say, and sorry for interruption. Um, no, 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 we voted it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I just persisted. Uh, what, lo, what Laura said about sort of the er different areas of law coming together and transferable skills is absolutely right. And I was increasingly being recognised. So I think it was Lord assumption who gave a speech about this a couple of years ago and said you know increasingly you are getting bits of area of law of one area of law being argued in another area of law and being accepted and you can see why because a lot of the time they are the same principles and the same skills it doesn't make sense that the thing we practice in on these separate silos which have no cross cross transferability when it is the law a lot of it comes from common law a lot of it comes from statutory interpretation uh, so being aware of our other areas of law and development in other areas of law is not a bad thing at all if anything it's a really good thing particularly if you have sort of one or two complementary interests um and like i said there is scope to build a diverse practice if that's what you want and i can't imagine it being a bad thing at all to say that to the right chambers which encourage those sorts of diverse practices um, uh, and so if, if that's what you want then I, i'd really encourage you to do so so you've written your application you've sent us off um leon how long does the average interviewer spend reviewing each application and do they skip to certain parts i certainly i certainly never skip i read everything 
Um, I try and read everything at least twice on it. Um, in terms of how long it takes me, um, it depends how long the application form is. Please don't make it too long. Um, I when I, I've not done it for the last couple of years because I've um, small children and things like that. Um, but as a set, we generally get about 120 applications a year. Um, three of us will review them. All three of us will read all 120 um, and we'll spend at least 10 to 15 minutes on each one. OK, basically, you don't actually get to bill any work for February. That's pretty much how it works. Um, and that will be true across almost all sets. Um, some sets kind of divvy it up. I mean, some sets get hundreds and hundreds of applications and they can't possibly have everyone reading one. Um, so, you know, I read everything very closely and I'm sure everyone else would 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 do that as well. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't think there's a there's a a more interesting bit to an application form than another bit. So I think it's just best to read through and read it through nice and carefully. We divvy it up in my chambers. At least um, I think it's three of us will read each application form. It could have been two last year, but I'm pretty sure it's three. Um, and I usually read somewhere in the region of. I'm not sure actually but it, it's less than 120 but it's tens and tens of them um, and I tend to read it from start to finish um, and I always read everything but sometimes as I go along I'll jump to the more detailed answers because I just think they're a bit more interesting um, and sometimes I'll want to read them first before I go back and look at your academics because they often aren't the, the biggest factor. Um, a lot of people have very similar academics. A few, a handful of people have exceptional ones. A few people have not so good ones and usually give an explanation as to why. Um, I tend to look for what jumps out at me. Um, I like to bill in February still. Um, and so I would say yes, probably 10 to 15 minutes on, on each, each application as well. But I do find myself flicking back into, well, on a tablet, if you can call it that now, um, to look back and go, oh, well, hang on, but does this fit with that? What, well, where were they during this period? And that takes some time. And so I like to see, not everyone likes bullet points. I don't get it. I don't get why I like bullet points, but certainly short sentences and short paragraphs that jump out at me are far better than one long paragraph of text if you're able to alter it like that on Pupilage Gateway. I know they change it every year as to what you can and can't do. Um, but really, um, you know, be very to the point with what you're telling me. If there's wishy-washy language in there, my concentration will just go and, and the force of what you're saying is far harder to come through. You know, the applications I remember, and we'll come on to a point about um, hobbies if we have time are ones with um, underwater rugby or a milkman delivering milk in the snow in West Cumbria um, you know they're the things I remember about application forms but you need to tell me something useful from the sorts of practical things we've discussed and make it pretty clear um, because that's really what will stick in my mind if I think you get what we're about and what this job is about. Laura um, have you been involved in marking application forms yet? I haven't yet. I think this year is going to be the first year that I'm marking, which after a while of making the applications is going to be interesting. But yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing I would look for. Something that it sounds really, really horrendous to say to people who are applying, make your application stand out. But anything that you think is unique to you is going to make that person who's reading it look back at that, that part. So whether it's a piece of work experience or you know, something that you've done or a piece of volunteering, if it's something a little bit different, then, you know, cling on to it because it's likely to attract someone's attention. Laura, did you have any particular um, hobbies that were unusual? Um, I didn't have hobbies that were unusual. Um, I hated, and in fact, it's not, I think it is on our Chambers application form this year, but again, hobbies is a, is a, funny one because it doesn't really add an awful lot apart from give everyone a bit more of an impression about you for me it was volunteering or my previous part-time working working in a shop or working in a bar that I actually got asked about in interview far more than 
um, my hobbies. So we've kind of touched on it, but just to go back, don't shy away from the fact that you've worked in Asda or Tesco because those things are, can still be asked about and can still be questioned because it might be you're the only person in that person's pile that day who's worked in a supermarket and that might make them go back and reread something else that you have to say. Christopher, do you think you need to play underwater rugby to guess pupillage? Uh, well, I got people who I don't play rugby or underwater rugby, so um, unfortunately not. I, I think I think the question of hobbies is be yourself. And there's a wider point here, which is that the bar is incredibly diverse. It, it still has a way to go on diversity issues. Everybody knows that, but it is already an incredibly diverse place with very different people with very different hobbies. And be proud of what you do. Um, you know, if you've got if you've got a hobby which you absolutely love, then put it down and, and, and talk about it. Likewise, your work experience and your past experiences and what you have done at university. Um, and the most important thing I think is having something to say and being able to talk about it in interviews. Um, and 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 being honest and not sort of faking it because if you, if you fake it then it will be found out. Let's be honest here. Um, and that does not look good in an interview and may may give rise to questions about your ethic, ethics. So be honest I think, with yourself. Yeah, I think that's a really um, interesting line that we're asking people to walk here is we're saying be the best version of yourself and sell yourself. But we're also saying don't oversell yourself. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I applied, one of my hobbies, um, and it had been for a few years, was hiking, particularly in Snowdonia. And I just happened to put on an application form, hiking, particularly in Snowdonia. And I got an interview and one of the panelists said, oh, see that you like hiking, particularly in Snowdonia. Oh, you'll know Pete's Eats then. And I said, oh, Pete's Eats? No, I'm a pinnacle calf girl. You won't get me on that side of the Clamberis Pass. And thank God that I actually knew what he was talking about. And it is you either go to one cafe in Clamberis or you go to the other cafe in Kapalkurig and it's you know, quite tribal. But that's an example of um, saying something where if I'd gone, uh, then it would have been obvious I'm not a hiker in Snowdonia because you couldn't not know about these things. Um, and so I think you do have to be careful with that and how specific you're going to be. Um, you know, if you like uh, 1930s cinema or something like that, again, be prepared that you will be asked about it if you put something that niche. But if you don't have something like that, I don't think it's the end of the world. So with that point on honesty, oh, excuse me, honesty and integrity, Oberon, um, wide question for you here, um, but let's try and keep it a little bit specific. What are your top tips on acing a pupillage interview? Um, <clears throat> displaying confidence but teachability uh, which is a balance um, you've got to be confident in yourself you're being you're applying for, for for a job which requires confidence but what we're looking for in a pupil is someone who is open to learn open to change their minds and open to new things um, we don't expect or want our pupils to come fully formed tenants. Um, we expect our pupils to be absorbing what we're teaching them and to learn from their mistakes and to be able to adapt. So um, how do you demonstrate that in the interview? You demonstrate that by being willing to change your mind when being challenged or um, if not, if 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 you, if, you, if if that's what you, if that's what you feel, but um, the, the I think the overall the overall message is that show that it, you will be a pleasant pupil to have, who will learn, who will probably make mistakes because everyone makes mistakes. I still do, and everyone still does, but you'll learn from them, and that you have an open mind that you're open to adapt. Leon, what would you add? You're on mute. We had to have that happen at some point. Yay, I'm glad I've managed to do it. For people <laughs> interviews, um, reread your application form before you do it. Um, reread any cases you've mentioned in it or any areas 
you know, get back on top of any areas of controversy you think you've mentioned. Um, there's nothing, nothing so painful as being in an interview and asking a question about something somebody has said in their interview in their application form, and just they you just get a blank um, because they can't remember or they've forgotten they talked about it or something like that. So do reread things. Um, uh, on top of that, try. I know it's really difficult. Try and get as much sleep as you can beforehand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that's. Um, easier said than done often. Um, Laura, you said that it had taken you a little while to get pupillage. What do you think it was in your interview for your chambers that closed the deal? Um, I finally relaxed. And that is probably one of the worst and best pieces of advice you can get because telling someone to relax is not the easiest thing to do. But I, as Leon said, he remembers his first pupil, a pupillage interview. I remember mine, it was a car crash. And the reason it was a car crash was because I had somebody on my shoulder, the little devil me saying, this is the most important interview of your life, do not mess it up. And then I messed it up. Um, so it was really easy. And then I finally went for, so I was one of those people who was a second timer at LAM when I got pupillage. And I um, had gone for interview the first year and had had nothing the rest of the year. It was my only interview. And I thought, well, it is what it is. Let's just see what happens. And I relaxed and came very close the first year and then, you know, relaxed the second year. And again, it really helped. Nobody in pupillage interviews is there to trip you up on purpose. You may be challenged in what you've had to say, um, so in my interview, we had to, we had to, um, it was almost like an essay question about what area of law you would change and why. And then I was challenged on it. I was challenged quite harshly on it, but it didn't mean that they were trying to trip me up. It was just putting across another point of view. And I made concessions where I thought I needed to, um, and didn't where I wanted to stand my ground. Nobody is there to try and, you know, trip you up. You are who you are. Um, and pupillage interviews shouldn't change that. You are, of course, going to be nervous. So find whatever works for you in making yourself not nervous. So get to chambers or get to the area where chambers is if you're having a in-person interview um, within plenty of time. You know, I used to go to the Costa at the bottom of Kingsway in London because that was my favorite place to go and sit before a, a, an interview because I could have a coffee and just chill out. Um, so find whatever works for you. If it's a remote interview, as I think some of them may be again this year, um, find your nice quiet space, put your comfy slippers on because no one can see you underneath the desk with your comfy slippers on um, and just relax, do something that's gonna help you because then we do see the best version of you in interview and it isn't a tense, uptight person who's terrified about making a mistake because as Leon said, uh, sorry, as uh, Oberon said, we, we all make mistakes still, so you don't have to be perfect in interview. Yes, we don't give up our weekends, our evenings, because we want to toy with you like a cat with a mouse. We do it because we want to find the right people for Chambers and we care about recruitment. You know, we're doing it for free at the end of the day. Um, so everyone who's there wants to see you succeed. And when we're asking you questions and following up and pushing you, it's because we want to give you the opportunity to show us who you are and what you've got to say. Um, Christopher, is there anything else you would add as top tips for pupillage interviews? I think the only other tip I have, um, following from what Laura was saying about the type of questions you might be asked, I remember in my first interview I was asked um, a similar question and I went for what I now realise was probably quite a controversial answer and I, I realised it was quite a controversial answer as soon as I said it because the deputy head of chambers who was chairing the panel immediately turned around and said that's interesting you're the first person who said that uh, defended so it was then challenged as laura was saying you know, it's all about defending the position challenging and, and conceding where appropriate but showing as our job is ultimately you can make a case and you can back it up and i think it's really important if you ask that sort of question give the answer which you are most comfortable defending because that ultimately is what you're going to possess on um, provided, of course, it is a reasonable answer which which you could reasonably give. Um, there's obviously extremes which you should never go to, but but I think it's really important. You you, ha you have the confidence, 
even if you think it's something which people might not agree with, if you can defend it and justify it, go for it. Um, we've uh, got a couple of questions left. There's one which I think we can give a fairly short answer on um, that I'd like to address because it always comes up um, in these panels. And let me just find exactly how it was written. If you've missed out on a very competent grade, so that's on the BPTC, and the question also often goes, if you've missed out on a first or a 2-1, is it recommended to go for an LLM? And would the Chambers consider a good grade on an LLM? You won't change a huge amount unless you get a distinction on your LLM and unless your, your LLM is in a very specific area of law that particularly um, works with what you're applying for. Um, so a corporate insolvency LLM, an employment law LLM, and then you use that to talk about what it is you're applying for and why. My view is a general LLM with um, whatever their version of a 2-2 is, a merit I think it is, doesn't really change much. Does anyone want to disagree with me? Make me justify my position? No. Well, I wanted to address that because it always comes up. It's often a train of thought. Um, and I think it's it's worth we give you that frank response on it. OK, um, well, we've got about five minutes left. And I think, um, again, we'll probably all have some views on this. Um, Interviewing in person is normally one of my strengths. What can I do to ensure I stand out and convey personality and presence during a video interview? Um, Leon, what do you think? Um, says the man with an incredibly cluttered background. Um, try not to have a cluttered background. Think about, um, think about the room you're in. Think about the lighting of it. You can see I've not done that either. Um, if you are using an application where you can blur in the background, then that probably makes sense. Don't do a virtual background unless you've got a green screen. I had the astonishing um, hearing a few months ago where I was um, sitting um, on a bar disciplinary hearing and we had one of the advocates switching through different virtual backgrounds every five minutes, which was um, obviously detracted from his submissions. <laughs> um, do you think about camera placement um, on things like that? Um, more generally, I, I found certainly um, you just need to be, one, very careful about not talking when you're still on mute. Um, sometimes you need to just put a bit more energy in if you're on a screen rather than in person. I've certainly found that um, when I'm doing submissions or, or teaching online. Um, so have a think about that. Um, and I know this sounds terribly sad. Try not to slouch too much. Um, things like that. Body body language is still very obvious. I appreciate it's it's you know top half of the body language, but body language is still there. So think about um, those sorts of things as well. Oberon, what would you say? Perhaps uh, picking up from video hearings that you've no doubt been doing. Yeah, um, I mean, this is something I've learned from sort of observing a judge during a video. Um, hearing it's that um, but the subtleties of body language below sort of this area is lost will be lost and you'll be surprised how much body language is at, would actually be subconsciously picked up in an in-person interview by body language below below sort of this area so when you are doing the video interview only this bit will be visible so think about you know do you want to have a ring light for example that lights up your face in front of your you know behind your laptop do you want to smile a bit more, speak a bit more loudly? Do you want to use a headset or not? You know, what works in terms of making you feel less detached and remote and being a bit more immediate in the room itself? So things like lighting, things like how you're dressed, things like, you know, your facial expressions to make up for the lack of you know, body language below the chest, things like that. And I think practicing with those as well. I don't know what your online learning is like at the moment, um, but I can imagine perhaps still your any conversations are quite informal. The way I'm addressing you now is the way I would address um, a hearing, uh, a judge in a hearing, or um, clients in a conference. I wouldn't be like this on Zoom with my friends, and and I probably, as Leon said, would be sat back like this because that's actually where my chair sits me back so I've got a cushion behind me to make sure I'm sat up straight um, so practice all of that beforehand so you're comfortable with it because we've had months of doing hearings 
top tip there for you, Leon. We've got to think about our backs now. We're getting on a bit. Um, you know, we've had months of getting used to this and refining it and, and getting better. And so maybe even just think if you're in lectures next week or seminars where you're conversing, think about dialing up the formality of it for the next few weeks whilst you're waiting for interview um, uh, invites to come out. Christopher, is there anything you would add in terms of how to come across well on video? Just a practical tip of um, if you're in a shared flat, make sure you know make sure your flatmates know what you're doing and ask if you can go to a quiet. Um, don't have, for example, works being done in the room next to you if you can avoid it. You might not be able to avoid it. That is part and parcel of working from home uh, and we've all had to deal with it. But if you have the ability to ask friends to you know, wait an hour, it's well worth in advance saying to your friends, I have this really important interview with your flatmates. I have a really important interview please can you not do A, B, C, D during, during that hour? Um, and so just have that little bit of forethought and, and put, in, put, in, put that into place. And same actually probably goes, if you're sharing a flat, ask them not to be on Netflix or <laughs> anything that takes any kind of streaming. I had a, uh, a hearing yesterday when my partner, who's a barrister, was on a conference and luckily the judge said, oh, we don't need cameras on it because of the type of hearing it was. Um, I've upgraded all the internet network, the house and the like, but I was still really conscious about taking up the bandwidth. So as soon as she offered it, I turned my camera off um, to try and conserve that. So think about that in advance as well. Laura, so, anything else you, oh, sorry, Christopher, go I was on. gonna say the flip side off, off that, Laura, if I may, is if your IT does fail, and sometimes it does, don't panic. Um, some, make sure you know who to get in touch with if that happens. Get the message and say, I'm really sorry, you know, the IT has failed. Uh, and please don't worry about it. I mean, it happens to all of us. I was in the middle of a, of a conference with a client and the internet started glitching. Now, fortunately, it was all fine, but we've all on this panel got those tales of your internet provider, Josh, not working for whatever reason. Um, that's fine. Don't panic about it. Yeah, it really does happen an awful lot in hearings. Um, Laura, how about you? Is there anything else you would add? Um, again, again, it's the awful piece of advice I gave before. Relax, find something that works for you. So, for example, in, in remote hearings now, I still do put on, maybe I'm weird, I do still put on a full suit um, because I can't actually, if I've got, you know, jeans on beneath my suit top, I actually don't feel like I'm doing a good job because I feel like I'm playing about with it. So it may seem strange, but get dressed up as you would in the interview, because then it's one less thing to worry about. You're not worrying that if you happen to stand up, your pink fluffy pajama bottoms are gonna be seen by the whole panel. It's just one less thing to stress you out. So get dressed up as if it was the interview, because then that will put you in that interview mindset. And if you are a person who comes across well, um, in pupillage interviews in per or in interviews in person, then you're halfway there by getting yourself in that mindset. And it starts by getting yourself um, ready. I echo what's been said by everyone, particularly Chris, about trying to make sure that your housemates um, are aware of what is going on, bribe them with chocolate or alcohol if necessary, that they can just shut up for an hour. Um, and then, yeah, we're all so much more used to this now. I think if that question had been asked, a year ago, you might have had a bit of a different answer from the panel, but we are all now, as most barristers are, so used to working online um, for short and for long periods. So it's much more relaxing to all of us, where I'm sure interviews that were conducted last year were probably far more stilted, um, but we're all used to Zoom, we're all used to Teams, we understand your internet is going to glitch. Um, so as Chris said, make sure you've got the emergency contact numbers of whoever has sent you the link um, or their email address that you can email them and say something's gone wrong. Um, it's just making yourself prepared and that will automatically make yourself make you come across as more personable because you're relaxed, you're prepared, you're as you would be if you were in person. I think that's a really good point. Anyone who had hearings by video last year, I bet it wasn't great. Um, but we're all more used to it now and I'm sure you all will be as well. And as I say, if you practice on being a bit more formal on video in the likes of your seminars or even you know, doing mock interviews um, or just chats with your family where you're thinking about these sorts of points, um, then I think you do have a good opportunity to come across well. My main point would be to speak more slowly. 
Um, that's always something we would say. But when you get a few lags in the internet and you wait for what's being said to catch up, if you've been speaking too quickly, then it really bunches up. Whereas if you speak a bit more slowly, there's far more chance what you're saying will come across well and will sound professional. Well, I'm afraid to say that's all we've got time for. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of the questions, but we've tried to pick up the key ones. Um, I also understand there were some technical issues with some people being able to join in. So we apologize for that, but this hearing, it's not hearing, um, this seminar has been um, recorded from the outset. And so hopefully that'll give you the opportunity to pick up um, any more points that you missed at any stage. Yeah, I just wanted to say a thank you to the panel for answering all those questions very thoroughly. Um, and again, sorry about the technical issues. As Laura said, <laughs> it's a new world, this one. But yeah, there will be a recording and I'll contact you shortly with where you'll be able to find that. But thank you so much, panel. And a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Nice to see you all. Usual Zoom wave bye. <laughs>